vows about the ministry of Jesus. And this is what he says. <clears throat> Precisely because Jesus only left to the church the apostles and their mission, the New Testament does not offer any single mandatory model, emphasis on single mandatory model on how to structure the church. And even less, a model given by Jesus himself or by the apostles. It's a very free kind of a, uh, what do you call this, movement. And it, if it's a movement, then it almost fits uh, easily into a particular context. So it adapts itself to one context, to the Jewish context, as Matthew would be doing, or it adapts itself to a, a more Hellenistic uh, uh, context, such as Paul would be doing in terms of the different churches in Greece at that time. So, <clears throat> rather, the New Testament provides various examples of how different churches were structured in answer to the needs and demands of different historical moments. It is true that from those examples emerge some generic lines or guidelines, but they never constitute a finished model for the church. So, Jesus Christ did not give us a finished model except, of course, his own person. Uh, his own person is not finished either. It's a continuing kind of a, uh, a modeling that uh, Jesus is, is, is making. And we are being asked to do precisely what Jesus had done here. So I think it's, it's important for us to, to bear in mind that uh, many of the things that we have now in the church in terms of ministry may not be traceable to the time of Jesus. But there are certain ideas that could have been the origin of some of the, the structures and organizations that we have at the moment. For example, the whole idea of the hierarchical institutional. Jesus Christ was not talking about him being a pope or him being even a bishop or even the apostles were not speaking of themselves as being bishops. That is much later in the development but not in the New Testament. It's not there in the New Testament. So let us not mistake uh, that uh, because we would like to, 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 to locate the, uh, the, the roots of the hierarchical institutional structure of the church to the Bible that we, we, we end up trying to uh, twist the context of the New Testament and the Gospels. According to Faust, from a historical perspective, <clears throat> the evolution of church structure could have taken place this way. First, the structure of the church at Jerusalem, it's imitated the Jewish organization, understandable, because it was, they were still part of the Jews. This was very prevalent, for example, in Matthew. But during the Christian mission, it passed to groups of communities with a very charismatic organization, okay? A kind of a, a first Jesus and his disciples. That was the core of the ministerial group of Jesus around the person of Jesus and the apostles were there, sympathizers of, of Jesus. Now, when Jesus had gone up, he had resurrected and had gone up to heaven. Now the apostles went into the different communities and talked about the message of Jesus. So at this point, there developed groups of communities with some very charismatic uh, perspectives. In other words, certain people consider themselves as having been given a particular gift to, to, to help in building up the community. And that gift is called usually uh, charism. So the charism of leadership or the charism of taking care of the sick or feeding the poor, etc. Those are different, they consider uh, charisms. But from there, the uh, charismatic figures came to dominate. So, but polarized by the charismatic figures of an apostle or a charismatic itinerant. Paul, of course, in his writings, he would be talking about himself, considering himself as an apostle. Not the 12, he's not a member of the 12, but he is still an, an apostle because he had been given a special kind of a mission. He felt he had been given a special kind of mission from Jesus 
uh, himself. And when these apostles die, then you have you know, the development of the presbyteral form uh, that uh, became part now of church history or church structure. But there's a, between the different priests, of course, there is someone who is what we would call a leader. And this is something that is still uh, visible in our own diocesan structures nowadays. If the bishop is the head of the diocese, there are certain, if the diocese is very big, then it's broken up into different vicariates. And there's a vicar foreign who is in charge of this particular vicariate. Under the vicariate, of course, there are other parish priests. And the vicariate normally consists of three or four uh, parishes, and each one of each parish has its own parish priest. But the, uh, the, there's a vicar foreign that is in charge of, or what do you call, overseer of these different uh, parishes belonging to his uh, vicariate. All right. <clears throat> You see, from a historical perspective. Now, the monarchical episcopate, as found later in Ignatius of Antioch, will develop only maybe after the second century. Monar mon more monarchical, okay? All right. From a theological perspective, Jesus left the church simple, with, the, with, the, with an apostolate or with a mission. The church is a sent community, not a closed one and fraternal, not hierarchical. In other words, community. We are community, we're all equal. We are being sent. We are being sent on a mission. Just as Jesus preached about the good news, let's say in the, in the, the area that we now call the the Holy Land or Israel and Palestine. So also the apostles were being sent to the different places in the Roman Empire and beyond the Roman Empire to speak about this message of Jesus. The community is ultimately responsible for the mission. So if there is going to be a minister, it's the community that does ministry. Now the community, of course, designates one or two people for this kind of ministry or another kind of ministry, but it's the community basically that controls. And the community consists of not just one who is uh, above everybody else, but it's a community, community of persons who are brothers and sisters. They come together and they decide together what could be the practice at that time. It discerns the activities in a given place or locale. So very important for us to, to bear in mind that this is something that is, that is handled uh, very well by the, the community. So in a sense, again, drawing from the ecclesiological perspective, from the, type, the idea of church that the early Christians had, it was always a church of communion. That's where you get the community. They were in communion with one another. They have a leader, yes, but the important one is your community. And sometimes, of course, in, in contrast to what we now have, you know, I am the Pope or I am the Bishop and all of you are under me. That's not a communitarian perspective. It's more a hierarchical perspective. Okay. Jesus left a church sufficiently free to shape itself and to adopt models as, as, it, sees fit, as it sees fit. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, I guess it, it's it's mark of a, a great wisdom for someone to organize something, but at the same time to just talk about the bare essentials and then allow the others to modify them according to the context, according to their own situation. All right, let's talk about the apostolic age. I know it's going to, yeah, still have time. Here we're talking really about the time after the death of Jesus, or before the time, before the death of Jesus, because 27 CE would be before the time of Jesus, up to about around 70, towards the time of the, the death of uh, Paul. What is the historical context? This is what we would call the first generation 
of uh, the Pauline churches. This is after Jesus, but it is the first, say, 20 years or 25 years after the death of Jesus. <clears throat> And what do we find here? We find Christian communities in different parts of the Eastern Mediterranean states. So we talk about a church in Jerusalem, the church in Ephesus, the church in Antioch, the church in uh, Thessalonica, the church in, uh, Corinth, in Corinth, and eventually, of course, the church in Rome, different uh, communities. And if you follow the voyages of uh, the missionary journeys of, uh, of Paul, you would find that he was all over. He was really an itinerant uh, missionary going to all the different places. He was being sent to preach the, the good news. Without Paul, I don't know what would have happened to the, the church. Definitely Paul had a great impact on the what we would call the Hellenistic part of the, the Roman Empire uh, because that is that was his basic uh, focus. Now, during this apostolic age, the community would meet normally once a week, but in someone's house, private house, therefore, or a rented house, it has to be a location that is... Uh, accessible to, to everybody. And it's, it's important to, to, to see this because this is really what is called you know, uh, uh, domestic church. We talk about private church. Domestic church is the kind of a church that is, whose center is in the, uh, in the houses of people. And sometimes it goes from one, one, uh, one house to another house. That is what, what is being recreated in our basic ecclesial communities. Uh, the, basic, the BECs that I know of normally uh, transfer, they, go from, they move from one house to another house. They do their biblical reflection or Bible sharing from one house this week and another house the next week and then make a kind of a rotation. This is, it must have been something that the early Christians also had done. You have to remember that uh, at this time, they, they were permitted to, uh, I mean, they, they could organize themselves with the communities, but there was a great deal of, of uh, negativity, a great deal of uh, even I mean, hostility and animosity against them because, of course, they were a special group, or at least they were considered a special group, or maybe they were considering themselves a special group. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there's a kind of a judgment being made on the people who are outside of this group. So you, you, can, you can imagine it's something, something like, uh, what do you call this, the, uh, <clears throat> the El Shaddai group, you know? If it was only a small group, of course, some people would say, oh, they don't belong to the mainstream church. They are a sect, secta, uh, but it's not, uh, but that the same kind of uh, uh, understanding, uh, I think it's at the back of this, uh, this formation. <clears throat> So once a week meeting. What is the time or the day of the meeting? Usually the Lord's Day. And the Lord's Day, of course, is Sunday, around 4 to 5 p.m. Were they having a, what do you call it, meet, uh, were they meeting together for the breaking of bread early in the morning, as we Christians today, nowadays, do? I, I don't think they were meeting in the morning. I think they were meeting much more in the, in the evening that it's probably after work. That's the reason why they, they, they meet in the evening. It's after work. Because the morning and the afternoon are spent for doing your own particular work. But the meeting includes meal and then a Eucharist. Thanksgiving, reflection on the word. Okay. Which one comes first? It varied, I guess. But again, this two part is always important. There was a meal and there was a Eucharist. Thanksgiving with the reflection on the word or somebody would be talking about, let's say an apostle, if the apostle happens to visit a particular community, they will be asked to talk to us about 
your experience about Jesus. Talk to us about this miracle. Talk to us about what happened in, in, in the temple. Talk to us about this and that. That is their reflection on the word. That is basically the, the liturgy of the word. We have stylized it and formalized it in the liturgy of the word, but that is really what the, the whole uh, origin of that uh, particular practice. So a meal and then uh, Thanksgiving, time for Thanksgiving. So in this particular context, it was important that uh, there was going to be a leader. And the leader usually is the owner of the house where you, um, as it happens now in BEC community, when the household owner or other leader from among them, perhaps changing from meeting to, to meeting. So no such thing as an ordained leader. No, he is a household owner. But they were also performing other ministries, visiting the sick, for example, helping the poor, the orphan. These are what we would call social services or instruction, teaching people. In other words, relaying what I have learned from the apostle and then relaying it to the next group. That is what we call instruction. <clears throat> so what, uh, for example, Paul, when Paul experienced this uh, great uh, time of conversion. He went to Ananias and started to listen to Ananias about what happened. <clears throat> According to 1 Corinthians 12, among the prominent leaders were the apostles, the prophets, and the teachers. The apostles were the ones who were connected with Jesus. Now the word apostles were not necessarily exclusive of the 12. Apostles would be anywhere. Maybe they considered Mary Magdalene as an apostle, or maybe they considered Paul as an apostle. But the 12 are all those 12 that are named in the, uh, in the, in the gospels. <clears throat> so necessarily the apostles could be more than the 12 but the 12 were definitely a part of the group of the apostles. But there were also some prophets, you know, in the whole history of the Jewish people, prophecy always played a very, very crucial role. In what sense? Prophets were always regarded as the spokesperson for Yahweh. They were sent by Yahweh with a particular message. That is why they, people were, were attracted to John the Baptist because he spoke with a great authority and he was acting like the other prophets, the prophets from the Old Testament. So it was always something for the, for the Jewish people, they always listen to what prophets have to say because very, very likely they have, got, they have their inspiration from God himself, from Yahweh himself. But then there are also are some other teachers and teachers are different from prophets. Uh, prophets, in the idea of prophets have more to do with witnessing, witnessing, but also uh, declaring something that is a teaching from, from Yahweh, a kind of a reminder. Whereas a teacher is someone that teaches you, this is how to do things. This is what we're going to, to, to believe in. It's a little bit more calm, whereas prophets have a kind of an edge in them in that they, are, they, 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 they tend to unsettle people the prophets and the subtle people. Now there was a distinction that is still very, very broad at this time between what is called the episcopoi and the akonoi, those rendering social services. Episcopoi, if you go to the, to the Greek, epi of course is over and kopoi is to see. So like microscope, scopus. Uh, <coughs> oh. Bless you. Somebody just sneezed. Bless you. Okay. The overseer. But in other words, another word for a leader. Or a patron of a house. When you come for a prayer meeting, you come for the celebration of the, of the Eucharist, you have someone who is the leader there. He is an overseer. He is the one who guides the community. And in the diaconoi are those who are rendering social services. And social services here, we talk about visiting the sick, visiting the sick and doing something for the poor, the orphans, and uh, the widows. Okay. 
But aside from this, there were other charisms or spiritual gifts. The charism of discernment, the charism of speaking in tongues, the charism of, uh, uh, what is this, uh, maybe taking care of the, the person. The first is the finances of a particular, uh, that was managing these things. These are all charisms. Sometimes the same person does these responsibilities, others Mute, Julius, mute. Please mute. Mute yourself. <coughs> okay. So uh, sometimes it depends on the context, it depends on the situation. Sometimes one person would do all, all these things or be the leader at the same time also the one who would give social services, the, what we now call deacons, the ones who, who, who does something in, in terms of, uh, what do you call this, uh, assistance or what you call pastoral, pastoral care. <clears throat> and at the same time, he would be the one to lead the, uh, what is this, the, the Eucharistic celebration or the celebration of the breaking of bread. So, the leadership, ministry of leadership, is connected with the episcopoi, but also connected with the patrons in the house churches. For example, in the Philippians, uh, you find that the, uh, the patrons are the ones who are the, what you would call the sponsors. I am going to sponsor the meeting this coming Sunday. So I'd like to offer you here and I'm going to prepare food for you. So we're going to eat together. And then of course, we will talk about the Eucharist about the breaking of bread and we give thanks to God. We have a prayer meeting and we will uh, uh, hear from somebody who tell us something about what happened uh, with Jesus and his disciples, etc. etc. Okay, the ministry of prophecy or the uh, is the prophets were the discerners of the inspirations of the spirit, in other words, they are the ones who more or less are considered by the people as having a kind of a link or a contact with the with the, with the, with God or with the voice inner voice in addition they can also be doing uh, pastoral services like helping the sick the ministry of offerers of sacrifice now this is not yet what we would call the cultic type we don't have the priestly celebration in the temple for example being brought down into the level of the houses, the communities. No, that is not the kind of the offer of sacrifice that they talk about. More in line with the kind of offering thanksgiving. In other words, a prayer leader. A prayer leader probably is the best thing that uh, can, uh, can characterize this particular type of minister. Okay. But you can see already that this, the, the work of this, this leader has to do with more with the uh, something to do with with prayer, something to do with sacrifice, something to do with uh, with a kind of a Thanksgiving celebration uh, activity. Generally, though, the idea of offering sacrifice is for all Christians who unite with Christ in His sacrifice. That's more general and theological. So, when we talk about the whole community offering that, this is where we talk about everybody in the community, even now. When we say offering, it's not just the priest offering it. Pre-Vatican II, yes, it was the priest offering it, and the people just join in. But here in the Eucharist now, all of us offered. We are led by the priest, but it is our offering. And of course, this is very beautifully established when we talk about uh, what is this, uh, the procession, the offering of the gifts, because that is exactly what, how, how we participate in the, in the offering. Our gifts are gifts of ourselves or the gifts from our fields, from our work, etc. There is no mention here about ordination rites. New Testament, no mention about ordination rites. The house church implied some form of patronage. Okay, I can imagine that, uh, I mean, nowadays, for example, who are the ones who sponsor some of the, the masses or the, the big feasts? We usually go to the madrino and madrina and the padrino. You know, we would like to be the uh, 
you know, the sponsors for the, this year's fiesta or the sponsors for the, uh, this particular activity. We go to particular people who have the means to help us, whether it's money, whether it are, are things, or whether it's a place you can, you can, you can uh, host this particular activity. If you have a big enough house, you have enough with, with garden, you can probably host a community where 30 people, 30 or 40 people would come together. So, so there's a kind of a patronage uh, there. <clears throat> now, and many of these are, of course, uh, uh, voluntary. Many of them are voluntary. They're probably sympathizers of the apostles of, of Jesus, that they are willing, in, in, in the experience of Jesus himself, you know, he would go to friends of his. Some of those friends are Micaiah. They have, they are pretty, pretty well off. They're able to host him. They're able to feed him, not only him, but also the apostles. So this created mutual, but not egalitarian social bonds in the community, but non-egalitarian uh, social bonds. In other words, there's always a special place for those who are able to host or able to contribute more because of what they, they, they can offer. But in fairness to them, of course, they're also very willing to, uh, to, to do that, maybe because they were also converts. They were people who really were sympathizing with uh, the message of Jesus. Thus, even in the first Christian communities, a considerable amount of ministry was actually done through the patronage system, that is, by individual initiative of well-placed people. We normally don't consider it as a ministry. You know, the donors, the financi financiers in our parishes, do we consider them as ministers? Nowadays, of course, we do. We do. We, the, so there's a finance uh, uh, council, there's a finance group, that advises the parish priest on how to raise funds and how to spend the, the money properly and account for the money uh, properly. That's also a type of ministry. And that ministry, of course, is able to be given or to be handed on to people who are able to function in, in, the, in that regard. So when we talk about this, what we call the apostolic period, <clears throat> in the column on types of ministry or ministries. We have the house leader, episcopoi, quote unquote. The reason I put this unquote, quote unquote is because the idea of episcopoi, diaconoi, would actually come a bit later. Seven years, 50 years later, we're talking about episcopoi, presbyteroi, and diaconoi. That's already, but here, something like that. That's why I put it in, in, in quotes. It's something like that. They are not yet uh, established. Uh, so they are, they, there are also some group that would uh, render social services. They are what we would call the diaconoi or the, the deacons, although the name is, it itself is not yet uh, established as we have them now, or even uh, seven, say maybe 100 years later. <clears throat> but there were the apostles, there were the prophets, there were the teachers. They were the offers of sacrifice, but there were also people who were offering reconciliation. But the reconciliation was always done in the context of the community. So if somebody has sinned, somebody has offended others, that's brought up in the community. And it's the community that acts. It's a community that forgives. Now you will see this when you start uh, studying the sacrament of reconciliation. There's a period in the church where it's the community that accepts back the, uh, the penitent person. It's not so much the priest, it's not so much the bishop, but it's the, the whole community. Of course, later on, it was going to be given that particular responsibility was given to the bishop first, then to the monks, and then to the, to the priests later on. But a very important ministry for everybody, the whole community, is witnessing. When people call you a witness, it is a kind of a, a, a badge of honor. You're a witness. You are someone special because you have seen something and you are proving that with your own life. Okay. What, are the, what is the ecclesiological or community perspective? In other words, the ecclesiology that govern this kind of uh, 
It's always the community of the disciples of Jesus, the followers of Jesus with a mission. So their whole idea of, of being a community is that they're not just for themselves. They're always directed towards others. There's, it's not just a community ad intra, but also a community ad extra, always reaching out to others. Their message is not just for themselves, it's for other people to share also. That's one type of ecclesiology. And the other one is the ecclesiology of a community that is gathered around the memorial of Jesus. You're talking here about the memorial of Jesus. And we are all gathering together because we would like to remember what Jesus had told us. Where two or three are gathered in, uh, in my name, there I am in their midst. So we are talking about Jesus. Jesus is the center of our, our life. We are a community gathered by Jesus. So not just the community of the disciples of Jesus, but the community that is a bit larger community, but living the memory of Jesus or embodying the, menace, the memory of Jesus. Up to a certain point, you become more closely disciples or you become kind of a witness, then you belong more, more fully in, in the church. But there's also a perspective, an ecclesiological perspective that Paul had brought up. And that is the ecclesial perspective of the community as the body of Christ. The community as the body of Christ as an ecclesiology is much more organic. In other words, there's a, the, the whole, if you go back to, to 1 Corinthians, for example, when he talks about the body of Christ, what Paul was trying to say is that we are responsible for one another. Just as a body is responsible for one another. If someone is in pain, then we also uh, feel the pain. If someone is happy, then we all feel we're happy. So it's a kind of an organic community. But at the head, of course, of this body is Christ himself. At the head, in the center of this community is Christ himself. We have become now the body of Christ. It's a beautiful ecclesiology that is going to be used in many other ways, especially in the later on in the, the Eucharistic uh, celebration. So how did they understand ministry at this time? Ministry is always, always has a purpose. It is for the building up and care of the community members. We take care of the poor, take care of the sick, we take care of the widows because they are members of the Christian of the community or they are people to whom we are being sent. So it's always directed towards the other, but building up, building up. Ministry is not just a matter of power, not a matter of exercising a lordship over other people. No, it's always service. Ministry addresses wide range of needs. So where there is a need to do this or to do that, then a Christian disciple of Christ should be ready to go and uh, do something for that other uh, person. Okay, now the community shares in the ministry. The community, the, primarily the, the number one minister is the community. So it's a community responsibility. So ministry is not just for select people in the community, it's for the whole community. But within that community, there are certain persons who are designated a special kind of task. You take care of the sick, that's your responsibility. You take care of instructing the children. You take care of the, You take care of talking about uh, these things before, let's say, the adults or the non-Christians. That is your particular ministry. Okay, so in the community itself, the, the community apportions the different tasks and responsibilities to the different uh, persons. Ministry ultimately is always service. Okay. Now, here is where we stop because we talk about this next class. Ministry.